So, thank you. And uh, thank you all for showing up. My name is Pazam Iri, and I'll speak about trolling the weather. Um, first, allow me to introduce myself. I'm a system engineer. I get a master's degree in electro-optical uh, engineering. I worked for 10 years in the aerospace industry as a system engineer team leader. I have six years of experience with communication uh, systems design. I launched two weather balloons with elementary school pupils, which will become relevant in a few slides. I'm a former DEF CON speaker, DEF CON 29, and I uh, gave a talk at Besides TLV this year. It's been a very good year. Um, why trolling the weather? Uh, where it all started? Well, it all started when I read an article about a country that's been trying to launch a satellite into space and is suffering from a string of failures. And it kind of amused me because I thought about all the engineers and all the generals which are sure that someone is probably sabotaging their work because uh, if you remember the uh, quote from the old James Bond book, once is happenstance, uh, twice is coincidence, but three times is enemy action. And it kind of amused me for a couple of hours thinking about everyone there at that country thinking there's some James Bond character driving around in their country, sabotaging their work repeatedly. And he's doing it all alone, and he's a superhero and whatever James Bond resembles to you. And uh, after being in my James Bond mood for a couple of hours, I started wondering, can I stop a satellite launch? And can I cause it to fail after liftoff? and can I do it on my own? And it quite amazed me when after a couple of hours I realized that the answer is yes. And it's not that hard because all I need to do is just control the weather. And this is a very hard claim because nobody can control the weather. Um, the weather is the weather and we are who we are and we cannot do anything to influence the weather, hardly can do anything to influence the weather. But we have a very good relationship with the weather. We are sampling the weather in uh, numerous ways. We are gathering the data, we are analyzing the data, and we are building models of the uh, weather. And we call it weather forecasts. And we are using the information to decide, uh, should we operate this airfield? Should we launch this satellite? So if you have the ability to influence the data stream, which goes into the databases, you have a powerful tool to influence decisions. Um, you have to understand why there is a strong relationship between air vehicles and the weather, because um, there is no all-weather air vehicle. All air vehicles are limited by a certain uh, weather envelope that guided their design. Uh, n nothing can fly at any terms in, and at any time. And you probably all seen that one time or the other the headlines launch delay due to weather conditions. And in the most simple way you can see it by thinking about, for example, lightning. Uh, it can cause electrical damage to an uh, aircraft. It can cause structural damage to an aircraft. And uh, the same with hail. Rain can freeze over control surfaces or the wings and cause the aircraft to stall and fall from the sky. And my work uh, is built around an interesting fact that there are high winds, high turbulences uh, in the air that you cannot see in any uh, uh, regular means. For example, you, you, it is not tied to, dry, to uh, a rainy day or thunderstorms. You can have a perfect sky, everything looks great, but you have a very dangerous turbulence out there and it can cause damage to aircraft that will try to pass through it. And the way to measure these high winds is with a weather balloon. So here you can see a weather balloon in the picture. Um, on the upper side you can see the balloon itself. It's partially filled with helium and the higher it gets, the more it is getting filled with helium because the external pressure drops. On the lower side, the small box that you see is the instrumentation that does all the measurements, gather the information, process part of the information and transmit it to the ground. And in the middle you can see a parachute because when the balloon pops around 100,000 
feet up in the air, everything starts to fall down and you don't want to get hit by your, uh, on your head with a radio sound, which is the name of the instrumentation. And therefore they are attaching a small uh, parachute that will slow it down so when you get hit on your head it won't kill you. Um, I quoted here from an article that was uh, written by Ian Dudley from the Vandenberg Space Force Base and he wrote a very good article describing the relationship between the uh, activity at Vandenberg and the weather balloon um, and the weather balloon's operations and it was very good for me as an attacker to understand how it works and to design my attack. Um, here you can see a launching station. There are about a thousand like this all scattered all over the world. And if you think about it, 1,000 is not that big number. If you want to really <laughs> influence, then you can gather a thousand people and do a lot of damage to the world. Um, they, each site is launching usually two balloons per day. Some of them are launching more. And as you can see, they're um, checking the radio sound in the hangar, uh, inflating the balloon inside the hangar, tying them both uh, up together, doing final test, go out of the hangar, release the balloon, and the balloon flies off. And the reception station is usually located there and starts receiving the data from the weather balloon. Um, here's some more quotes from a senior meteorologist at Vandenberg. He's saying that the data goes directly into the databases and the national weather models, which is great for me as an attacker. If I know that it will go directly into the computers, then woo, big success if I can uh, insert my data there. Uh, another important uh, thing to remember is that depending on the launch they are launching, uh, depending on the uh, satellite launch they are launching, be releasing between 5 and 15 balloons uh, to get a much more accurate and updated data of the high winds. And uh, he's saying that the upper balloon support is critical to Vandenberg's activity because you, you've all seen the movies, eventually before a launch there are about 30 people sitting next to each other and every, everyone has to say that the launch is a go for their system and the weather is one of the uh, considerations and there's a weather officer there and he needs to raise his thumb and he's doing it according to the information that he's getting. So if you can insert data or falsify data within the system that will show him that the weather is great but the weather is not great then he will approve the launch and the launch might fail or if you can manipulate the data and cause him to believe that the uh, weather is not okay, even though it is okay, then he will not approve the launch and the launch will be delayed, millions of, millions of dollars going to waste. And to make it more interesting, you're probably thinking, okay, Vandenberg, Vandenberg is a very, uh, we hope, <laughs> a very secured base and uh, let's see you trying to attack it and not getting got, caught. But NASA is gi giving uh, more information and NASA is demanding that for man launch, uh, man missions, um, you have not only to have good weather above the launch site but also in the downrange. And it means a lot of stations around the downrange needs to raise their thumb and say, listen, the weather is, here is great, do the launch. So uh, if you don't, if you are intimidated by attacking a Space Force uh, base, then you might not be intimidated by attacking such a civil uh, hangar uh, with a simple reception station that nobody guards. Um, okay, so I have uh, malicious intentions and I want to uh, um, inject data into the system so, and I want to do it on a radiosound so I need to pick the radiosound that I'm going to emulate or attack. And here you can see a list of the um, most common radiosounds and you can see that the Vaisela RS-41 holds 30% of the market. So I said to myself, okay, this is my target. The RS-41 transmission frame is the basics of the RS transmission frame are uh, presented here. There are two, several sub-models of the RS-41. One, the most common are uh, the RS-41 SG and the SGP. The SGP has a pressure sensor on it, the SG does not. 
Uh, the basic frames has 320 bytes divided into blocks. I'll go over the blocks in the, in the next slide. And they use data whitening to get the data noisier when it is being transmitted to the ground, so the reception equipment will have an easier time to uh, decipher the, to decode the data. And uh, NDNS, little NDNS, uh, bitwise, bytewise, and two layers of error detection and forward error correction. Each block is protected with CR16. Uh, and the entire frame is protected with a uh, Reed Solomon algorithm. Here you can see the uh, bytes of the frame, inside the frame. The first bytes are the head header bytes, and then come the uh, forward error correction bytes, and then one byte for frame type, and then come the blocks. Uh, the first block is 79. Um, it is a status block. It holds a lot of general information, such as serial numbers, board temperature, control data, and so on, and also subframes, which I will mention in the next slide. The next, next block is 7A, which holds the measurements that the, air is, that the radio sound is taking um, from the air. And then there are three um, GPS blocks. Um, the first block is GPS information. It holds time and the uh, number of uh, space vehicles and the quality of reception of each space vehicle. Block 7D holds the raw data, the um, relative velocity and distance of the radio sounds from the uh, space vehicles, GPS space vehicles. And the third block is the positioning. Uh, you have their position and velocity and the number of satellites that are, are um, being uh, used to, for the uh, position calculations and the accuracy of both velocity and position and so on. Uh, the most interesting block is the last block, 76. It's an empty block. All of the bytes are zero except for the two CRC16. Why they have it, I don't know. Um, as I mentioned, the um, status block holds uh, also subframes. There are 51 subframes, 16 bytes each. And there's a lot of more general information, serial numbers, uh, board type, um, um, calibration data, and so on. Here are the RS-41 RF properties. It transmits between 400 and 406 uh, megahertz. The output power is 18 dBm. Uh, the modulation is uh, GFSK, and it's very easy to receive the transmissions. All you need to have is an RTLSDR, an antenna, and you can pick up signals from very far, far away. And uh, it's nice. Uh, there are thousands of people all around the world who are who uh, built such stations in their home, and they are looking in, uh, at the decoded data and also tr transmitting the data to uh, databases, uh, public databases where, where they are gathering the data and uh, give the public uh, access to that data. And uh, it's a great community. Uh, they are tracking the radio sounds and what, mostly what they're doing is uh, tracking the radio sound as it falls down and go with their car and pick it up and get a free STM32 uh, evaluation board falling out of the sky. So I have malicious intentions. I have my uh, target. So the first thing that I can do is jamming attack. When you want to do a jamming attack, you take a powerful transmitter and you transmit jamming signals. My weapon of choice was the Heltec Automation uh, LoRa Node 151. I just searched for the um, transmitter and then the name Heltec popped up and said, oh my god, this is a sign. I have to use this board. And so I used it. And it has a very good LoRa chip. It has a very good microcontroller. It transmits 20 dBm, which is great for my work. It carries its own battery, a lithium battery. It costs $20 on eBay, and it weighs 25 grams, which is also great. And I will add, uh, talk about it in the next slide. OK, so let's see how it looks like. Oops, this will work, yeah. Uh, on the right side, you can see the RS-41 emulation equipment. It is transmitting, transmitting log files. This is the reception equipment on the left, the RTL SDR and the computer. And in the middle, you can see the little board, which will be used for jamming. Now I start the radio sound emulation. It goes to an old log file that I have. It gets a message and transmit it and get another message and transmit it in a cyclic, cyclic manner.
Here you can see the transmission on the RF level. And here you can see the decoding software. <coughs> this is what the operator sees. In the middle, you can see the radius on position and velocity. On the left, you can see some general information like the uh, radius on ID. Here you can see the GPS time and the state of the space vehicle's reception. And this is the status of the subframe's reception. These are the measurements that the radio sound is taking. And this is the GPS navigation data. Uh, the decoding software is getting the information over the computer audio from the RTLSDR, so you can record the raw data, as you can see here. And if we'll zoom in, we'll see these are the preamble bits followed by the data bits inside the message. Okay, so now that we have a working um, RF path, uh, let's add some jamming. Here you can see that the RF level, the old transmission, the radio sound transmission versus the, and the uh, jammer. And when you record it and look at the audio, it's a mess. You can see here the jamming signal. It's a very simple signal transmitted half of the time. And here you can see it being mixed with the uh, radio sound and it's unrecoverable. And of course we have no decoding. Remember that it weighs 25 grams so you can tie it to a birthday balloon <laughs> and get it up in the air to follow the radio sound and they will both fly together and be so happy and the poor people on the ground will be so sad because you are not only attacking the local reception station but now you are attacking all of the reception stations across the way. Um, the U.S. National Weather Service is supporting 102 sites, each launching two balloons at precise time, twice a day. And uh, what will happen if 50 people will decide to jam the signals? And it will be very bad because um, professionals say that it will really uh, lead to errors in the weather models and forecasts. Okay, so this was one example of how you can harm or troll the weather. Um, speaking about the uh, message decoding, and I mentioned earlier that there are thousands of people around the world, thousands of people around the world um, supporting the um, radio sound tracking community. And they developed a lot of tools, um, and they studied a lot, um, many models, um, most of the models that you've seen in the list are already uh, can be decoded by their software. And they lot, uh, wrote a lot of tools to receive, decode, process, and when I wrote my work, it was based on their work, and I'm standing here on the shoulders of giants, and these are the giants. Um, what I've developed is a simulation framework. Um, on the right side, you can see the transmission part. On the left side, you can see the reception part. Uh, in the middle of the transmission part, you can see a Python-coded simulation strip. This is the heart of the uh, RS-41 emulation. It can um, get uh, updated GPS satellites data from a file that it downloads from the internet. It can use um, RS-41 log files and it can manipulate the data using the simulation framework I, work, I wrote that gives the uh, scriptwriter a lot of uh, operations that to manipulate the data, to create frames, to create blocks, and so on. 
The uh, script can either send the uh, data directly to the decoding software if the, it is installed on the same computer, or it can uh, transmit the data with the radio transmitter to an RTLSDR receiver and from there to the uh, uh, decoding software. The framework has four libraries. One is for block level um, operations, one is for subframe operations, uh, one is for uh, manipulative uh, functions. For example, if, I want, if I, have, uh, uh, I want to falsify the position and velocity, then I can enter the position and velocity into a um, function that will create the three GPS blocks, and if I will transmit the three GPS blocks, the receiver will believe that the data is updated and is active right now. Um, and the fourth library is general simulation uh, functions, such as manipulating, uh, reading log files, using log files, and so on. When generating messages with the framework, you can either uh, synthesize complete uh, frames and subframes, and, uh, but it's very hard because it requires of you to have a behavior model for each measurement. And you have to remember that most of the measurements are tied together. So it's very hard to build your own uh, weather emulator inside uh, your computer, but it's possible. The framework will not stop you from doing it. A more simple way is to take a log file from an old uh, flight. It could be a year old, two years old, or last week and uh, retransmit the data, but manipulate the data, for example, replacing all of the serial numbers uh, to a new serial number and or updating the GPS data that it will not be a year old, but it will, looks like that it's a present live GPS reception right now. And uh, it's a much more easier path, and this is the one I used. So, now that they have malicious means, uh, malicious intentions, and I have the means, I can do some spoofing. Uh, to do some spoofing, all you need is a powerful transmitter, and the technique is this one. You receive all of the subframes from the radio sun that is flying right now in the air, and then you prepare for spoofing, you set up your transmitter and everything, and then you jam the uh, receiver. And this is done because um, it is very hard to adapt all of the data at the same rates, at the same offsets, uh, from one frame to the other, from the radio sound frame I just got to the frames that I already have from the log file. So to mitigate it, I'm jamming the um, receiver for a few seconds, raising the data uncertainty, and then I'm starting to spoof the data. And the operator will see that it lost the link for a few seconds, and then the link return, and he has good data. Everything is great. And I transmit all of the spoof data, and then I'm doing the same thing again. I'm jamming the signal, raising the data uncertainty. And you have to remember that this is much more difficult because while I'm spoofing the messages with recorded messages, the radio sound is doing something, and I usually cannot anticipate what exactly it is doing. So again, I need to mitigate between my data, falsified data, and the radio sound data. And the jamming does that very well. And then I stop. And that's it. My data inserted into the databases. It works because of the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, you make the receiver believe that the strong, healthy uh, signal that it is picking is the main signal while you are transmitting it with the spoofing transmitter. And you want the receiver to um, experience the low signal from the radio sound as noise that is interfering with the main signal. And to do so, you have some uh, signal to noise uh, thumb rules uh, numbers here. Uh, for example, if they are both transmitting at the same uh, power, you get jamming and not spoofing. But if you get 25 dB uh, margin between the two or more, then the receiver will accept the signal as a good valid signal and will be fooled by the spoofing transmitter. To get this margin, uh, you need to be familiar with the free space, loss, uh, free, uh, space path uh, loss versus distance. Um, when the radio sound leaves the station and drifts away, the power at the receiver drops very quickly. 
And if you are close to the receiver and the radio sound is far enough from the receiver, then you'll, you'll, ha you'll get the margin that you need uh, regarding the signal to noise ratio. Um, if you cannot get very close to the, or close enough to the reception station, then you can do several things to get the power up at the reception station. Uh, one is to use directional antenna and concentrate all of the power on the reception antenna. Another way, way is to use a power amplifier, which is simple, but it works. And if there's something between you and the station, then you can elevate the transmitter, as I showed earlier, with a balloon, a kite, a drone, or whatever you have. Okay, so let's see how spoofing is being done. Uh, this is the RS41 log file transmitter. This is a spoofing transmitter. And again, the reception equipment. Now I'm starting spoofing, uh, no, sorry, starting emulating the RS41. Again, you see here the decoding software after a few hours of receiving the RS41 transmissions. And the trigger for the spoofing attack will be when it will reach 20 kilometers. Now you can see the jamming, jamming, jamming. And now, spoof data. And this data is based on an old log file and I offset all of the required parameters so it will look uh, very smooth. Now you get jamming, jamming, jamming again. And the spoofing stops. And you can see here a small jump in position. And this is what I talk about, about raising the data uncertainty level. The operator looks at it, says, okay, I lost a few packets, seems to be fine. This simulation, I added two things. One, I changed the temperature and the pressure while uh, spoofing. And the second thing that the entire simulation and decoding is run on the same computer. I'm using the audio link as um, transmission media. You can see here that the temperature and the pressure are changing a bit. Changing a bit. It's hard to see, but in a minute you'll see the effect. And this is what the weather officer will get. He will get the, uh, the graph of pressure versus temperature and I created a circle inside the graph. And now he is looking at the circle and his superior is asking, can we launch? And he don't know what to do. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of um, how difficult it is to write such a script. So here is, are the main um, bullets to uh, build such a script. Uh, this script, for example, takes data, uh, all data, uh, from that was recorded on one side, and it will change all of the serial numbers uh, on the in, and IDs in the transmission. And it will also offset the position of the radio sound. And it will make it, it look as if there's an active radio sound flying right now somewhere, even though it's not. And to build such a script, you need to define the new serial numbers, IDs, and so on, define the position offset, uh, read updated GPS satellites uh, data uh, from the internet, because you want to emulate a flight that is flying right now. Um, read the log file, read the uh, data that you want to use for retransmission, uh, set up the RF transmitter and or the audio stream and initiate the transmission thread 
uh, that will transmit the data upon an event. And then the script will go through, it will initiate a transmission loop. And in the transmission loop, it loads a message from a log file. It recovers the data with the forward correction. It will update the ID, serial numbers, and so on. And then it will calculate and update new CRC for the status block because that's where the, this data is stored. After that, it will extract the uh, GPS position block data. It will offset the balloon position and it will recalculate the three GPS uh, blocks to make it look as if the flight is occurring right now. Then it will prepare the data for transmission, it will wait for a time event and it will trigger the transmission thread and the data will be transmitted. This is how it looks like. On the upper side you can see the original flight done somewhere in the US and on the lower side you can see the spoofed uh, flight emulating a flight of a radio sound above the Pentagon. I wonder how they look at it. Okay, mentioning the Pentagon, the RS-41 has also a military model which is called SGM. It is intended for military use. The word intended is right there. <laughs> I will speak about it in a minute. Um, it has two features. One is radio silence. It will remain silent until a certain time or a certain height. And the other feature is uh, data encryption. And regarding the radio silence, it's because the manufacturer is claiming that if you use radio silence, you won't, uh, the, the enemy will have a hard time to understand where the balloon was launched from. Um, it's not really military in the sense that most of the properties were not changed. They're still using the same civil uh, frequency band. And they are still using the same properties, modulation, bitrate, and so on. And they're still using the same framing, message, uh, framing method. So each person who is receiving other RS-41 models, uh, <coughs> sorry, will be able to receive the SGM and understand there's an SGM flying right now over my house. And this is not very really military because usually the military is good in hiding things, not declaring up in the air, I'm here, I'm here, I'm operating. And this is very strange. And only the data, the measurement block and the GPS blocks are um, encrypted. And as I said, you're still very aware that the military is operating here. Um, another thing which is not so military is that the encryption is not always activated. When you, you are monitoring these flights of the SGM around the world, you can see that in many cases uh, it is not uh, active. I don't know why, it's very strange because the military usually believe in doing the same thing over and over and over, so the soldier will be prepared for war. And what's funny is that when it is not encrypted, it's the same frame as the RS-41SG, uh, but it identifies itself as the SGM, so you still know that the army is operating here right now. Don't know why. Um, the claim that the radio sound transmission will not reveal the balloon launch uh, location is very funny because, for me at least, because when I launched the two weather balloons with the uh, elementary school pupils, uh, we uh, downloaded software from the internet that can uh, analyze the position of the radiant sound and according to wind models predict where it will fall to the ground. And it gave us very good results in both uh, cases and uh, it's funny because you can do it the other way around. If you have the wind models and you know the position <laughs> right now so you can make a very good um, assessment where it was launched from and send your troops there. Um, one last thing is that I, I mentioned it earlier that at Vandenberg they are launching a lot of balloons before they are launching a satellite. And it means that if you are um, monitoring the um, Air Force Base next to your house and you see that they are launching twice a day as they should and suddenly they are launching a string of uh, radio sounds then you know that they are up to something even if the data is encrypted you still know that the army is about to probably launch. 
Um, when you are looking at coping with spoofing, uh, which is important, uh, I don't think encryption is the way because key management is a headache. Uh, most of the launching organizations are not military at all. And they are not prepared to start management keys and hiding information from each other and uh, synchronizing reception sites and so on. And it, using encryption requires significant upgrades and it most likely won't be welcomed by most of the customers. And it's bad for the radius on community because they want to get the data. And the data is not secret. It, the, 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 get, the, the, get, the radius on launch is publicly funded. So why can't the public get their antennas out of the windows and receive the data? It's not secret. I think that what should be done is to authenticate the messages. There are so many methods to authenticate messages. Uh, you can take the existing, existing messages and add authentication tags. For example, in the case of the RS-41, perhaps find a good use for the empty block and add an authentication block instead of the empty block. And customers who are not interested in using authentication will not use the, the authentication and the community can keep up doing what they're doing. And it is most important to understand that the authentication can be done offline. You don't have to do it online. And it's a potential business model. I'm the manufacturer of the radio sound. I offer a service. If you are suspecting that the uh, last flight was perhaps uh, uh, spoofed, then send me the log file. I will check it up and I will tell you if it was spoofed or not. And I will charge. So it's a business model. Um, when I developed the framework, and it was a lot of work, I at first started to use it in investigating and understanding the decoding software. Different decoding software and different models, uh, different um, operating systems and so on. And um, when I finished it, I realized that it's a very good tool to examine th th these uh, software, develop these software, test these softwares. And so I've decided to upload all of my code to this link. It will be uploaded after the talk. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> hey. There are some references here. And if you have any questions, I'll be here for the next couple of minutes. Thank you.